worldwide supply chains still haven't found a new balance. What's this year's outlook on shipping rates and port congestion? Let's talk about that during this webinar. Hello, good morning and welcome to this webinar that we organize in cooperation with Zencargo. Cargo owners are still suffering from an increasing number of ships not arriving as scheduled. Performance is furthermore declining and container rates are remaining at record highs. How to cope with this and what can shippers expect for the rest of this year? We're going to talk about that during this webinar with three guests. Here in the studio is Bart Kuipers, port economist at Erasmus UPT. And joining us through a video call are Jens Andersen, Head of Trade Lane Asia to Europe at San Cargo, and his colleague Laura Odell, Head of Air, Demand and Supply Europe. If you have any questions for them or want to make comments to the other attendees, please feel free to use the public chat of this webinar on the right side of your screen. Bart, hello, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. So, what's your outlook? Should we prepare for a long winter or is something on the horizon? Well, in general, I think a long winter. Um, I think that uh, spring or summer is not really on the horizon uh, concerns to the problems uh, with uh, uh, the container trades. Um, I had some discussions with shippers in, in Rotterdam in the fashion industry. Well, um, the problems they, they saw uh, before Chinese New Year, not able to have, have their cargo on the ships, is really a problem, a big problem. And especially for the smaller shippers, it's, it's not, it looks not very good. And is it uh, mainly capacity or price or uh, both of them? I think it's both of them still. And okay, the people, uh, quite some industry watchers expect maybe a soft landing after the summer. Uh, that could be, but uh, then it will be a, a, indeed a soft landing, uh, not back to normal. And, and is it, should we blame the, the, the carriers or the ports or both of them or even the manufacturers? Uh, I think the, the problem is really, um, you should really, you could blame the carriers because, well, they, I think they are uh, with their strategies of blank sailing in the beginning and um, uh, what they were doing uh, further up in the year, uh, last year, I think they were a, a big source. But what, what is really uh, becoming much more clearer is that you have carriers and carriers. Those carriers, what you see is that they are diversifying their strategies. Um, you have Maersk and CMA, CMA CGM. Uh, well, they are trying to develop themselves into um, uh, more or less forwarders and trying to manage whole chains. And I think that will be um, a softening effect on, uh, on tariffs because mm -hmm. well, they are becoming customers from themselves. And what you also see is that in certain trade lanes, you see you, you saw an, an increase of uh, the reliability, yeah. um, especially in the fruit trade lanes. You see some smaller shippers uh, that improved their uh, performance in, uh, in, in last, last year. And, well, uh, they all are not using um, the big container terminals. They are using specialized terminals. They are uh, working in niche markets like the banana trades, so those type of companies, um, they ha have a very good performance. Of course, they have an increased, also increased, increased tariffs, mm -hmm. but you do not show the congestion. And, and that could be an, an, a new model. Um, what you also see, what was stunning, to my opinion, was that the, um, the market share of the alliances in the Trans-Pacific trade dropped quite consider considerate. And you see that in this trade lane, Outsiders were able to well to get a, a huge market share from the alliance carriers in in last year. And is that mainly due to the high tariffs? So then it becomes more interesting and a better business case to do it yes. uh, via another way. Or? I think they sh they see market opportunities in the Trans-Pacific. So the regional carriers, the Asian carriers, they are also uh, uh, crossing uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, what you also see is they are searching for alternative ports, um, not the Long Beach, Los Angeles um, uh, complex, but other ports. And I'm very but, curious. But are the, those other ports able to handle uh, larger volumes? Yes, because 
uh, these outsiders do not uh, sail with the very big ships. Uh, they are sailing with smaller ships, yep. like the uh, the fruit carriers do. So what what my I'm very curious if we can see this happen also in the Asia Europe trade in the future that outsiders um, may have um, a share of the market. Well, uh, quite some consultants they do not think that is happening. Uh, you could also say the problems in the United States, the the the, the West Coast are uh, even worse than yeah. than Europe. Yeah, of course. So yeah, this, yeah. Um, so I think that that you see there Amazon, uh, uh, Walmart. And in Europe, also IKEA, mm -hmm. all searching for alternative solutions. So that might be some light in the horizon. Yeah. So the, the market will find a new balance, but yes. not at the current state. No. But if the tariffs remain at current highs, then yeah. you you will find a lot of alternatives. So carriers need to lower their prices, but they will hold on to it as long as they can. Yeah. 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 I think that that's the case. But if those carriers are focusing on supply chain management, um, they have long-term uh, relations with big shippers. And I think that that is only possible by a dampening effect, a, a softening effect on, on tariffs. You cannot uh, ask uh, like a company of Maersk, like, well, we are going to manage your whole supply chain. But I'm sorry, for the ocean track, you have to pay um, uh, the highest price um, we can think of. So I think that also. So there are some softening effects to be expected before all the all the new container ships and the enormous yeah. amount of containers will arrive. Yeah, but are, are carriers able to um, to be as good as current freight forwarders uh, to to handle all the? Because it's, oh, yes. it's one thing to handle great volume, but it's yeah. another thing to handle all the contacts and 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 all the details and. The, uh, things go differently than you expect. Yeah, that's the traditional question. Is an ocean carrier able to transform into a forwarder? Uh, 30 years ago, we had the infamous uh, 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 practice of Netloids uh, here in Rotterdam. They failed. But I think these are different times. If you, if you look at the investment of the carriers, they have the, 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 the uh, money available for merger and acquisitions. Well, yeah, uh, but they, CMA, uh, they, they, they already bought Damco a few years ago, for yes. example. Do, who remembers that name uh, still? I, but uh, <laughs> if you see the, the number of, of specialized uh, professionals that are hired by those container carriers that, that have this strategy of becoming more of a forwarder, well, they, they are uh, employing thousands of IT specialists, of marketing. So I think that they will succeed this time. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, well, what will that mean for their ocean product, and I think the ocean product, well, it, they they will not count in uh, profits per teu, or mm -hmm. feu, so to say, they will uh, become a totally different industry. Well, that ma might have a, a, um, a dampening effect, a, a softening effect on uh, on tariffs in, in the middle long, uh, in the middle run, and on the long run, well, you see those new ships yeah. arriving, uh, etc. And uh, before we go talk to the other guests, yes. uh, to, to summarize for the, your outlook for the coming month, yes. uh, let's see, until uh, June, July, August, um, will, will it remain at current capacity prices and difficulties, or will we see a softening in the coming months uh, already? Well, I, I think, um, um, if you ask me, it will be very problematic. Look at what's happening now with uh, the wind problems uh, yep. this month. Uh, it's all adding up to the, the existing problems. All the warehouses are full, the container terminals are full, um, so the, um, the carriers are, are very important to create a problem. The terminals have to solve the problem in a bit because they have to handle with all these big ships, all these late arrivals, uh, all the unreliability. So I think the f in the future there has to be, uh, mm -hmm. s th there should be change uh, with respect to uh, to the container terminal operators. Yeah, so let's see what the vision of uh, Zen Cargo is. Um, on the video call is Jens Andersen, head of trade lane Asia to Europe at Zen Cargo. Jens, thank you for joining in from London. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, if you hear some big noises in the background, it's exactly the wind and the uh, storms that Bart was just talking about. We have a proper storm here in the next couple of days, so uh, I hope I hope my roof will stay on my office while I'm on the call. Yeah, here in Rotterdam we have the same problem because uh, I don't think that the terminals are running at a high capacity at the moment due to the wind because uh, 
yeah, if, even my my power price was was is it will be very low in this afternoon. But that's another topic. Right. But let's go back to. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I will, I will just reflect on what Bart was saying earlier. You know, there will be no short term uh, quick fixes in terms of capacity or rate or schedule uh, improvement. Um, what we have seen though is that. Uh, carriers keep on deploying more and more equipment and TEUs. We have seen like a 20% year-on-year growth in uh, TEU uh, deployment, around 400,000 TEU on Asia to Europe. But, but what the big problem is that the schedule is completely performing at the lowest level ever. Right? I think that they are, Asia Europe is operating at, a, at approximately 23% uh, performance reliability. And that is, of course, um, the big issue why we have all these um, blank sailings, because most of the blank sailings are, are really not intended. They're sort of what they call structural blank sailings, because the vessels are simply sitting still in, in, in a port or, you know, port or loading, a port of discharge, waiting to birth. And then they miss, they miss the slot, and then they miss, uh, you know, miss the next port call, and just, just escalating the whole problem worldwide. It's uh, not just Asia, Europe, but a worldwide problem with, with congestion in the ports. Yeah. And are, you, are you saying that the, the poor reliability and the, 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 the massive amount of blank sailing, that it's structural or that it will be temporarily? I mean, some of them, because of the backlog in and port congestion, they simply cannot get containers on and off fast enough on their birthing slots. So that is forcing them to have the structural uh, plan things. They're not all planned. Uh, most of them are unplanned. So, uh, uh, and, and that is not going to change the, until, I don't know, maybe summer, as Bart said, it will be most probably easing up in, in the summer period. But when you look at industry leaders talking about schedule reliability, they, um, they reckon it will only be towards the end of uh, 2022 before we are sort of back to normal. And let's all remind ourselves that, you know, back to normal, back in days, they were still only operating at between 70 and 75 percent uh, reliability, uh, the best ones, the best performers. So um, if we can get back to between 50 and 70 percent liability, uh, reliability, that's already a huge improvement. Yeah. And, and what's your advice for importers and exporters? Should they wait a little bit uh, if they can uh, for their business or should they... Uh, find alternatives or just pay the price uh, that's currently on the market? I mean, at the moment, you know, everything is moving on fortnightly or monthly um, FAK rates, right? But uh, there are sort of overtures in the market that carriers are slowly starting to talk about longer term uh, contract rates in the market, one or two year, even we had about three year deals. So if you are sort of a larger importer in Europe, I would most probably start a tendering, a tendering process now to see what the, um, what the traditional alliances can come up with. Um, and if you are a smaller to a medium-sized um, uh, importer, I would most probably have a better bet on going to a forwarder because of the forwarder can have multiple solutions over the traditional uh, liner uh, market. But also, as Bart was saying, you know, the smaller niche players are coming in strong and fast uh, from China, for example, you know, char charter services into Rotterdam with a, like a 24 day transit time from Yangshan because they, they don't stop anywhere. And um, they could definitely be uh, an alternative to traditional. Um, Liner agencies and and, uh, and carriers. So, so you're saying you're saying that new players on the market are filling the gaps that the, the big and the large ocean carriers uh, leave behind. There is definitely there's definitely a huge opportunity for the smaller niche carriers. You know, with the 2,000 CEU vessels coming in, they also go to sort of the, the sort of more niche uh, terminals. You know, um, in China, you know, where there's no major congestion. And uh, they are, for example, into the UK, they call into Liverpool and Teaport, where there's a relatively straightforward throughput uh, here in the UK. So uh, they don't call Phillies or Southampton, where you might wait to birth there for days, right? And um, also those ports are totally congested with MC equipment. 
So uh, the least layers should definitely be like a short-term solution. Uh, I would say starting from most probably end of March, where they have much better schedule, reliability, more fixed frequencies, and uh, um, you know fixed loops to Rotterdam and, and to the UK. Yeah, I guess yeah. you see those niche players as a structural long-term solution, or is it just now because the market is so tight? There will, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, because of the because of the global uh, congestion, you know, it, it'll be until the end of the year before you see real real improvement. So it's still it's still a matter of trying to uh, hedge over as many opportunities as possible to make sure that you can actually move your capacity and your volume that you need to move. Yeah. And, and do you see any shifts for, uh, for, of the supply chains, for example, to by, uh, cargo by train or by air? I mean, train is already now a huge uh, offering into Europe, uh, into uh, also into Tilburg, of course, in Netherlands and in Duisburg and Eastern Europe and so. But it's, um, it's um, obviously not cheap and... Um, I guess only higher value commodities can afford to uh, pay for train or air. I mean, here I would definitely recommend for, for the smaller importers again, I would definitely recommend an LCL solution because LCL is very, very straightforward with fixed weekly frequencies, fixed transit times, right? And um, if you're sitting weeks and weeks and weeks in, in you're waiting, waiting to load a 40 foot container from somewhere, it's much better just to pump it out every week. If you have 10 cubic meters every week, just pump it out, fix weekly departure. You know the cost, you only, you only pay for what you uh, what you book, and you know when it's arriving, you don't have to sit and wait at the supplier's warehouse to fill out the box for weeks. So uh, I would definitely also recommend LCL for the smaller uh, port pairs where, where you don't have, let's say, tens or twenties of uh, containers per week. Yeah, okay. yeah we'll continue this conversation later on. Uh, let's uh, move over to Laura Odell. She's also joining in per video call. Laura Odell is head of air, demand and supply at San Cargo. Laura, a warm welcome for you as well. Hello. Uh, since the corona crisis, air freight has had its own problems with a great loss of belly capacity. Is air freight nowadays a viable option for shippers who need to get their cargo in fast or um, are they booked as, fully booked as well? So while we're seeing travel restrictions slowly lift um, after Omicron, we've still got a long way to go before we're back to any kind of normality. Um, capacity is still severely reduced compared to um, pre-pandemic times, and there is a risk of new variants um, and obviously subsequent restrictions being reintroduced. That being said, um, air freight can still be a viable alternative to ocean freight, providing airlines are given an, enough advance notice. There is capacity available, but it comes at a price. So it's important to plan for your air freight to avoid delays and last minute rate fluctuations. Being creative and looking at alternative airports can help too. Um, also being aware of like current market situations can also be useful. Yeah, because if you look at ocean freight, uh, tariffs are roughly now maybe 10 to 20 times as high as before the, the, the supply chain crisis. How is that on air freight? Also the same uh, amounts of increase in price or is it less? Um, so since the, the, the Chinese New Year, we are seeing um, the rates soften. Um, so rates are certainly um, not as high currently. Um, I expect that will change, you know, given the um, given seasonality and um, peak peak situations. Yeah, and do you see any improvements on capacity in the coming months in air freight with, with the world opening up uh, due to uh, the end, so we hope, of the corona crisis? Um, well, certainly for the first half of 2022, I don't see there being much change um, in regards to capacity. Um, I think obviously with the risk of new variants um, will hinder any plans um, that the airlines may have had to reintroduce any significant amount of any capacity to the market. Um, also, local lockdowns in China um, and the continued closed loop management system of their, their staff at the um, at the airports. Um, it's reduced. To, it's resulted in reduced staffing, um, so they're unable to handle any more capacity on in or out of the country at the minute. 
Yeah. And, and just now we talked about uh, a new niche players uh, on ocean freight that are coming up due to the high tariffs and the shortage of capacity. Is that also uh, the same uh, in air freight? Do you see new players coming up? Um, there's certainly, um, you know, new capacity coming into the market in in um, in the sense of charters um, and you know freighters that we haven't seen before. Um, we saw the freighters being in, introduced um, throughout the pandemic. So there are certainly more options um, in the absence of, of scheduled flights. Yes. Okay, Laura, thank you for now. We'll continue our conversation later on because I want to do some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Bart, first one is for you. Um, if some of the shipping lines also become forwarders, I would suggest that there would be higher rates for other forwarders. Do you agree, says Stephen Forsberg? That's, that is, of course, uh, possible that those other uh, forwarders also see a market opportunity to increase prices, but... Uh, now they are doing that the same. Eh? You, you read in uh, papers that these forwarders have long-term long contracts with, um, uh, with the carriers, but they are, um, the, the tariffs are uh, related to the spot market. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, um, well, it will put, put a lot of pressure on some of the forwarders. So you can also think the opposite, that they will m mainly react with lower prices because they have more customer knowledge, they have certain advantages, um, uh, which, um, uh, well, take some time for the carriers to develop. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, the next question is from Alec van Dijk, and Jens, I'm going to pass this one to you. Question is, if terminals and ports are already congested, how will the additional carrier cap capacity in 2023 lead to a normalization of ocean freight rates? I mean, there's no doubt as soon as the schedule reliability is up and running at a much, much better uh, percentage as it is today, and the equipment is in the right place where it needs to be, in the, in the right east and westbound, the main uh, chief eastbound and far east and east westbound rates, uh, sorry, trades, that will definitely put a softener uh, on the rates uh, in 2023. And... Um, and again, also, if you are willing to commit to certain uh, volumes, uh, you can for sure sign up um, longer term deals for, uh, you know, some decent amount of containers at a, let's say, much better rate as, as we see at the moment. It will, it will most probably go to, I don't know, eight, eight, nine, eight thousand in next year, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So next question is from R.E.W. Waarthuizen. And Bart, I'm going to pass this one to you because you already mentioned it a little bit. Do you recognize the effects of shippers setting up their own transport shipping like Amazon Prime and you mentioned yeah. IKEA? And I saw an example of Coca-Cola uh, yeah. with broke transport uh, a few uh, weeks ago. And he says, I learned that they use smaller ships and thus visit smaller ports. Will large shipping lines feel that effect? So should they be afraid? Uh, well, what is afraid? But I, I certainly think that it's an opportunity. And I certainly think that certain other niches um, may be the future. Um, one of the carriers um, I had some discussion with, they are talking about a specialized tech service. So high-tech um, uh, high tech products from Asia to Europe on, on a direct uh, service. So uh, instead of all the, this uh, hub and spoking, etc., so, yeah, I think that you can see uh, this opportunity rising. If it's a success, if going to smaller ports like Flushing uh, in the Netherlands, uh, and, well, you can think... Which, which port? Flushing. Oh, Flushing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or even Amsterdam mm -hmm. uh, might, might have a future, again, as a specialized niche container port uh, due to certain specialization of cargoes. So, yes, I think this will be uh, a, a very interesting option for the future. Yeah, so it's not the ocean carriers who should be afraid, but it's, it's uh, Rotterdam and Antwerp who should be afraid. It's, I think that it, it's, oh, yeah, that, that's also, well, afraid. Uh, they also can uh, develop their own uh, niche terminals. What Maersk uh, is now doing on uh, the Maasvlakte, um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, a warehouse for uh, for fruit and, and frozen products, yeah, reefers, reefer containers. Yeah. I do not. I don't think that they that if a reefer ship arrives, that the reefers first will go into the stack and then in the warehouse. So you see that also in in large ports that this already uh, is happening, and and you have other parts in the port of Rotterdam, like the uh, the traditional port areas in Walhaven. There is a potential for this type of uh, and, services. And is it because there is an increased demand of, for reefer containers, or is it because they want to optimize the supply chain of the reefer containers? I think both. I think they are, are wanting to optimize the supply chain for reefer containers because it's well time-sensitive cargo, it's high-paid cargo, uh, etc. So you see uh, all kinds of operations, also in the port of, of, of Antwerp, um, with these type of direct transshipment and direct. Uh, loading of cargo inside a warehouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next question is from Steve Duhu. Um, but also for you. Oh. Uh, because it's about port call optimization. Yes. And you, you know a lot about that. Um, if we experience rates going up, uplift in TEU and increase in congestion, which priority innovation should we pursue to optimize the chain? And he mentions, for example, port call optimization, or maybe there are different ideas uh, going on. Um, yeah, I, I think port call optimization, what we see right now is that the carriers are developing in more hub and spoke operations. So what they are, are, are doing is just concentrate their cargo uh, in, in one of the big ports instead of using more ports in a range well, if that is true, um, then the pressure on an individual uh, terminal will increase because um, uh, they will uh, do more transshipment uh, to uh, optimize their, um, uh, their patterns. And I think one of the big issues talked about innovation is that, well, this, these problems are really a reason to think of more radical innovation on the terminal side. The crane productivity is about the same for 30 years. Um, it's the same design. Uh, there is no breakthrough innovation in terminal design, in crane design, uh, while in ship design, well, th there are enormous developments in, in scale. The, yeah. So I think this is a real opportunity, this, this crisis in container trades, to think of a radical new terminal design. And that is something I haven't heard. Yeah, because the, all the ports are saying, yeah, the call sizes are so big nowadays, yeah. it leads to problems. And the yes. interland transport yeah. is yeah. also yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, being flooded with containers yeah. if so yeah. one of the big ships arrives. Yeah. So I really am interested what? in the terminal of the future do with you, a radical new design. Do you already have some ideas or do they need to figure it out themselves? Uh, well, uh, I do not have the ideas. I think that this, this really is something for very smart technological uh, developers. Yeah. Okay, next question is for you, Jens, um, from Perry Schoenaker. We've seen the increase of shipper-owned containers. Do you think this will continue the coming year? So will shippers uh, use their own containers instead of using those of the carriers? There has been a huge influx of shippers-owned containers we have seen because last year and also, you know, when the pandemic started, you know, with all the um, container fleet being occupied with PPI equipment and so, there was an explosion in these SOCs, and um, I think on, on a short-term basis, the SOCs will definitely help, you know, move because the equipment shortage has been one of the main blockers, obviously from China. And if you show up with your own container, obviously you have a ten times better chance getting getting them moved. So I would say I see I see the SOCs being around the next two to three years. Easily, may, maybe longer. What, what, is the, what is the main benefit for a shipper to use his own container? <laughs> to have the equipment available. So if you uh, if you book with uh, any shipping line, they say, yeah, uh, we have space, but we have we have no equipment. We can we can if you come with your own container, we you can get the space, but we we don't have any containers for you. We only have the space. So um, I, I see that happening for the next couple of years. Yeah, so, so you think the shippers should um, use this um, uh, the SOCs in their in their supply chain planning and execution strate strategies? Yeah, because the, to be honest, there's a lot of freight forwards that are also offering their customers SOCs. It's uh, a lot of the Chinese big forwards are, are investing hundreds of thousands in uh, in equipment to overcome the shortage of equipment, particularly at certain. Uh, terminals where there traditionally are equipment shortage, uh, 
um, so it will definitely improve and um, it's easier to negotiate at the moment with this pandemic, uh, just, you know, still, we're still coming out of this pandemic phase. If you show up with your own equipment, you get much more uh, space um, availability. And if you show up with your own equipment, you, you might get a discount on the rate. Laura Odell, is the, the shortage of equipment also uh, an issue in air freight or is, is it not? Um, I think obviously there is a high demand for air freight currently, um, which means that, um, you know, capacity, equipment, everything is, um, is strained. Um, we ha obviously have issues, um, not just in China, but um, in the UK and over in the US as well, where we've got shortage of staff. Um, which is resulting in um, in long queues and waiting time at um, at the airport as well. So that's obviously um, causing a, a strain on um, on the air freight as well. Yeah, and do, do you see an increase in in Bali for the coming months? Do you expect it? Because, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, all Corona measures uh, are scaling down or disappearing uh, in other countries uh, also. So we could expect an increase of passenger flights. Uh, do you also expect an increase in belly uh, freight? I mean, uh, I think, as I said previously, um, it will all depend on, you know, what happens in regards to new variants of COVID. Um, as you said, there are, uh, the restrictions are being eased and we're coming into the holiday period now. So there probably will be um, more capacity coming into the market, but I don't think it's going to be as much as everyone would like. Yeah. And there's a question from the audience for uh, Bart from Alec van Eyck. And he says, ocean air freights, will, will they ever come back to the 2019 level? Because maybe they were fundamentally too low in those years and we got accustomed to it. So the, the question is, will, will the 2019 levels um, in ocean... Will we, train... will we ever see them again or were they uh, bottom low and can we, for, well, can the, we forget it? The, the long-term trend is deglobalization. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the last years, at, at trade is slowing down. So uh, the, the growth in, 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 in volumes of containerized trade during the, uh, the last 10 years b before uh, COVID-19 uh, were actually lower than, than, than all those years before. So I, think, I do, do think that we will return to this trend after all, um, all, all the fuss at the moment. So I think in the coming uh, five to ten years, I do not expect a, a very high growth. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I once wrote a column for Newsblad Transport where I said uh, 2019 might be, might be peak container. Um, and I, I certainly think that uh, well, in, in a few days we see the, uh, um, uh, the results for the port of Rotterdam container uh, uh, throughput, and they are recordly high. So I know Probably, I'm not yeah. right. So 2019 is not peak container, no. but I th I think we sh really should be uh, aware that the long term trend for the coming years is deglobalization. It's less growth in containers. You so really think so? I really think so. So if if this all this new capacity is arriving yeah. uh, in a few years. So ship, ships are being built, yeah. terminals are expanding. Yeah, the yeah. terminals are expanding. Uh, there could be a surprise. So it's uh, like in, in, in the Netherlands, we say a pick uh, 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 um, a cycle, a vacuum cycle. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that I think, well, it's also in uh, uh, traditional in the shipping industry, uh, those cycles, they are emerging. And I think with all the capacity we, we are working towards such a, such a crisis, yes. So if I'm a ship owner I, a sh or a cargo owner, I shouldn't be too worried, maybe for the coming year, but yes. on, in the long end... Uh, this I, is, I think that this is a, a, a two, three years, and then a new reality uh, will happen. And I very much much think that this reality of the, of the, the 2025, 26 will be very much like uh, the past. But, but you see ocean carriers investing heavily in, in the whole uh, uh, supply chain. Yeah. Um, is that a wrong decision then maybe? Or are they too optimistic? Oh no, I think that I think that, that is a good decision. Uh, in, instead of port-port operations, just the whole chain, managing of the whole chain, I think that's a very good uh, solution. Uh, that, that is really adding value and that is really uh, searching for something different uh, diversification in the market, uh, differentiation in the market. As a customer, you have more to choose from. Uh, so I think that is a very good structural development. But I think that 
um, well, the, the increase of capacity that could be a problem uh, in a few years, yes. Yeah, so there's a question on this topic from Quinton Oostwegel, and he says, let's say that the seaside capacity problem is solved, like you are yes. expecting, and the terminals have innovated, like yes. you were wishing for. Can the hinterland capacity keep up? What innovations are necessary there? So is the hinterland um, uh, capacity ready for an, such... Uh, yeah, I th well, I think that um, uh, here in the Netherlands we have extremely large-scale hinterland solutions in inland shipping. Um, the inland shipping boom uh, with respect to e-commerce, uh, all the logistic hotspots, well, they did a very good job. So I think there will be capacity, and I think, but I also think that if those terminals innovate, uh, and what you already see in small ports, that there should be also innovation in, in those inland ports with automation, etc. And I really think that inland shipping will be a solution because of the shortage of truck drivers, etc. Yeah, but and the environmental it, impact. In the Netherlands, inland shipping is always an option, but in other countries it's obviously not. Uh, well, um, I think um, uh, Germany, uh, to a lesser, lesser degree, uh, but r d uh, don't forget rail. Uh, there is a really a renaissance of rail with respect to um, Belt and Road, and uh, I think that also rail is on the political agenda in, uh, in Europe. Yeah, yeah, but it has been on the political agenda, agenda for like 20 years, and uh, still the percentage on the model split is the, are the same. Uh, yeah, you're right, but I think with Fit for, fit for 55, things will really are going to, uh, to change, and what is, has been developed um, uh, with Belt and Road, uh, real from China, yeah. that is really new, it's really an innovation, and well, there are some nasty things in all those countries, Russia, uh, Belarus, etc., uh, Kazakhstan, where all these lines are passing, so they are vulnerable, and capacity is also uh, not very large, but I think th this, is, uh, um, uh, th this will be a uh, potential for the future. Yeah. Um, last question for you, uh, Jens. Um, if I'm a, a shipper or a cargo owner and I want to uh, modify my supply chains to be resilient for the coming years, should I look at short-term solutions or long-term solutions? I think, I mean, if you're talking Asia to Europe, um, as I said earlier, there are most probably certain alliances that are willing to look at longer-term rates at a certain, let's say, cap on uh, on TEU count on volumes. So it could be a, a healthy mix of tying in certain volumes on longer term contracts and then maybe tie in um, um, to get the space you require, tie in with maybe two or three other shipping lines and then maybe even have a backup with a, with a couple of forwarders. Where, where, where the forwarders, like us, where we can sp spread out, you know, capacity requirements on, on several solutions, several modes of transport, um, that might be a, a healthy mix of a bit of a fixed long term and, uh, let's say, other not so long term, but at least what you have to guarantee that your containers are arriving as, uh, as, where, as they are supposed to do on, on time. So, uh, yeah, a bit of a mix of everything would most probably be the better option for the for the smaller importers. Because obviously the, the, the carriers are, are really, really looking after their huge BCO customers. And, um, and, and they're super, you know, the Fortune 1000 companies around the world. They, the carriers want to form long-term partnerships with them. And that means that that's pushing out, you know, the, the smaller ones with the uh, less attractive volume. So, catching out, you know, with some smaller shipping lines, some niche carriers, as we said earlier, maybe just jump into the charter market and then hit your capacity through forwarders. So that will always find a solution. Yeah. Jens Anderson, head of trade lane Asia mm -hmm. to Europe at San Cargo. Thank you for joining us on this joining in on this webinar. So, Laura Odell. Um, last question for you. Um, if we look at the air freight industry, the corona had, had, has had had a really big impact. Uh, companies like Air France, KLM are really suffering financially and uh, the capacity. And um, you, you, there were more uh, charter flights coming up. What do you think will be the long-term impact after corona? Will it shift back, 
shift back to the old days or do we will we really see a long term structural impact? Um, I don't think that that we will go back to pre pandemic levels in regards to capacity for a very long time. Um, I think obviously we, we as I've said previously, we've got the risk of um, new variants. Um, and I think that will will have a, a significant impact on the capacity that comes back into the market. Um, I just think for, for long term strategy, um, we need to be able to utilize, um, you know, maybe alternative airports will be key um, for the future. Um, and also the ability to anticipate um, changes in the market and be able to react quickly to changes in the market are going to be imperative um, in the current climate. Um, maybe relying on um, more stable services, um, even if the rate is higher, um, and not risking using maybe lower cost services um, that may seem like an attractive option, but may um, risk stock levels. Yes. Laura Odell, Head of Air, Demand and Supply at Zencargo, thanks for calling in. Thank you. Um, Bart, to conclude this webinar with you, if we look at last year, Ocean carriers were the big winners. They, they made 120 billion uh, yes. or something like that. And probably this year that, that will also be the case. But who will be the winner of 2023, you think? <laughs> um, well, that, that's, that's a difficult question. I think in 2023, um, um, the, the shippers will uh, get back to normal. I think that they will be the winners because... I do not expect that the tariffs will keep that high. I, I think that uh, certain um, developments will uh, soften. Uh, I think reliable, reliability will increase just for all these niche uh, capacity, etc. And you should give the, 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 the carriers credit for one thing, that they did not design, this, uh, they did not uh, order a 30,000 TEU ship. So they, uh, most of the ships they ordered were 60,000, 20,000. They did not increase their demand for even bigger ships. And that was something I think that, that, that is um, very good because the ordering of very big, larger and larger and larger ships, that's also one of the big issues. So I am in 2023, I become a bit optimistic for, uh, for the shipper side. Uh, and also related to these forwarding uh, business that quite a lot of those carriers are, uh, um, are specializing in. Yeah, so big winner will be cargo owners, back to normal. Yes, back to normal. And how will the future relationship between ocean carriers and freight forwarders be, in your opinion? Oh, yeah, I think that that is very interesting. Um, I think that uh, a big freight forwarder uh, like Kuna and Nagel in the future, well, they they might acquire Hapag Lloyd, I think. Uh, that is one around. of the future scenarios that, that might be possible. So... To, to give an answer to, uh, to, to, to their competitors. So, so if, if you're buying up my market, we will buy up yes, your market. That, that, uh, so if, if you think out of the box, uh, that, that could be a development of all those carriers becoming forwarders, maybe big forwarders will become carriers because the Amazons of this world, they are also becoming carriers. And um, uh, if you are a cargo owner, um, uh, these huge cargo owners like Walmart and um, and you see it also in in, in the, the, the banana trade, Dolce Kita, very big exporters, uh, importers to the United States with hundreds of thousands of TUs. They are also so uh, we will be see for the last twenty years it was really traditional. Yes. You had the ocean carriers, you had uh, freight yeah. forwarders, and you had cargo owners. And now nowadays you see some platforms like for example, Zen Cargo was here yeah. uh, coming up. You yeah. see. Uh, ocean carriers moving in into the freight yeah. forwarding business, but you yeah. also see uh, cargo owners moving in into the carrier yes. business themselves. Yes. So yes. we're going to mix it up. Yes, I think that will be uh, that will be one possible uh, development in the future. Will be a quite interesting time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull uh, moment. Bart Kuipers, Sporting Commerce at Rasmus Jupiti. Thank you for joining me here live in My the pleasure. studio. And that's it for today. Thank you all for your particip participation, and see you all next time.